Well, if you've just tuned in, you're listening to a live broadcast, and, and I think exclusively everybody listening around the world, which there are about 14 people I've invited. If you're listening, then I'm glad you're tuned in. And I do have Steve Denoon on the line calling in from Israel. Wonderful brother in Christ. Are you there, Steve? Yes, I'm here. Just a little better. Steve, I got a little echo right now, but it will leave in just a second. Yeah, that sounds okay, real nice, better. actually. Amen. amen. And uh, just to okay. cue anybody in that's that's just tuned in here, if you're tuning in just late, actually you're right on time, and it's 11, 12 a.m. Eastern time here in Georgia. And if you're if you're tuned in, then uh, we haven't started the interview, but. Uh, we're ready to, and uh, I do have Steve Denoon on the line from Israel, and he's our born-again, spirit-filled brother in Christ, and I've chatted with Steve a couple times, and just to reiterate what I mentioned up front before even Steve came on the line, in case you're just tuned in, is that Steve initiated contact with me about 60 days ago or so, and uh, wanted to hook up on an interview and talk about several key topics this morning and like the topic of antichrist the topic of the third temple and also the topic of today's false teachers in the body of christ who uh, really uh, there's so many false teachings going on today so it should be an interesting 45 minutes and i as i said right up front in the broadcast in case you all have just tuned in that I know Steve's and my own purpose in this interview is so that people's eyes can be opened and will gain a Amen. clear understanding on these crucial topics and according to the accurate handling of God's Word, and particularly handling God's Word accurately at this closing hour in today's end times. And ultimately, I know Steve would just, with everything in him, agree with me that the ultimate purpose in this discussion today is to direct people that would be listening uh, to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord and do not let go of him and make sure that we're standing upright before God and ready, as Jesus said in Matthew 25, 10, that those who were ready went in with the bridegroom to the wedding feast at the rapture of the church. So I'm very excited to chat with you, Steve, and I'll go ahead and turn it all over to you, Steve, and let you just carry the ball and direct it, call the shots from this point on, my brother. I appreciate you so much, Brother Rob, and God bless you and all those that are listening here and will also listen when we upload this to our own channel. And and Brother Rob, just so I can let you know now, I'll I'll need to, once you're done on the recording here, uh, if you can send me a link where I can actually capture the audio, I was actually filming it to capture the audio, but I saw that the audio was, audio was not going to work properly uh, in doing that. So I'll be able to add the audio to it from your end just by capturing the that that from you later, if that's okay. I'm sure with, with you, and then that way we can. Oh yeah, when we get have, when we get done, we, Steve, within a couple minutes when. I'm sorry. Go right ahead, Steve. I thought you were done. No, you're you're fine, brother. No, that's perfectly. That's that's great. That's that was really my desire as well. And and I just for those that are listening already live there, I, I want to just. I'm sure you guys are well aware anyway. Brother Rob is just a phenomenal uh, Bible teacher. And uh, myself, I'm Jewish. I uh, was born Jewish, and uh, we we were not necessarily raised that way. But because but we we didn't get raised in the church that's for sure and uh, uh, but the the Lord got a hold of me at a young age and uh, but I come from both both mother and father from from Jewish uh, Jewish backgrounds and uh, so to know who the Mashiach is is extremely important for me it's important for my own people here in Israel and uh, and little by little we're seeing more and more of our people begin to believe but the topic that brother Rob speaks on a lot especially the Antichrist is a very important issue for us here in Israel and uh, because it is our people it is our um, our leaders here 
that are dealing face to face with the Antichrist, and um, and and some do know it. Some are aware that the Pope of Rome is the Antichrist, and some are not. And uh, we wanted to also air this interview on our own channel. Uh, couple of different reasons. One, we, we have an audience that's not familiar with Brother Rob, and secondly, um, when we load it, we'll be loading it from our Israeli IP address here in Israel, which will inevitably cause more Jewish people to find it, because when they do a search, we'll have it in Hebrew as well as in English, and uh, they'll be able to find the program, and, uh, and, and I know Brother Rob has just got a tremendous amount of knowledge on that. Um, so, and Brother Rob, I wanted to, uh, of course, we sent you some of the questions that are on our heart, and, uh, and I'd, I'd like for you to elaborate on these. And uh, one of the most important ones, and, 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 and of course, I know that you and I share the same belief on these things, but, uh, but for the sake of God and the revelation he's given you and, and, and where you derive your information from, I think would be good for any and everyone that would listen, even on our end, and that is the identity of the Antichrist and why you believe that he's not a Muslim. Well, number one, in terms of being a Muslim, that's not in the Bible. I know there are a smaller percentage, as you know, Steve, smaller percentage of teachers out there that say that, but that's not in the Bible, number one. There's no... Bible passage, Old or New Testament, that would even remotely suggest that Antichrist is a Muslim. I don't, um, uh, it's really that simple. It's just not in there. There's false teachers like Walid Shabbat that teaches that, and that's just, uh, it's not in the Bible, no possible way, not even remotely. But on the right side of the coin, the Antichrist, uh, I always go to Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, when somebody wants to know about the best Bible verse that shows the origin of Antichrist being from Rome. And in Daniel 9, 26, Steve, as you know, it, it literally pinpoints the city of Rome as the origin of Antichrist because it says the, that the people of Antichrist to come. Actually, it says the people of the prince who is to come, meaning Antichrist, who would come in the future. His people would destroy the city, which history proves and shows happened in 70 AD by the Roman Empire. So that's a historic fact that all of us as Bible prophecy people and students know that the, it was the Roman Empire, the Italians, in 70 AD, headed up by General Titus of the Roman Empire that destroyed the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD, which makes Antichrist's origin a direct link in having the same exact origin as those people. So we do know that Antichrist will be from Rome. That's very uh, <clears throat> black and white, simple verse in Daniel 9.26. One other quick point, though, Steve, just to frame it, is that the false teaching today takes the two terms antichrist and the other term false prophet and makes two different men out of those two terms. And those two terms, antichrist and then the term false prophet, are not two different men at all. They are synonymous terms that point to one and the same man being Antichrist. And uh, another uh, quick point to that main point there is that there's just one man coming, is that from John the Revelator's perspective, even during the vision itself, John understood that the Antichrist that John had written about in 90 AD, because John coined the term Antichrist in 90 AD, well, five years later in 95 AD, during the vision, John the Revelator understood that the Antichrist he had written about in 90 AD was the exact same man that John was seeing in the vision in 95 AD. And then one other 
point to that, which is revelatory to this generation, is the fact that John never uses the term Antichrist even once in the entire book of Revelation. Not once. He only uses the term false prophet during the book of Revelation. And he uses that term three times, false prophet. So from John the Revelator's perspective, John understood during the vision that Antichrist, that term, is synonymous with the term false prophet that John was being given a closer look at during the vision of being the greatest religious fraud, Christian fraud, in the last 2,000 years and ever. And so that's why he called Antichrist in the vision the false prophet. One and the same, one and the same man as Antichrist himself. Both terms being synonymous and pointing to the same man. Which is the Pope of Rome, because there's no other man in the last 2,000 years, no other entity or figure on the world stage in 2,000 years, except the papacy of Rome, that is a 100% match to Revelation's false prophet, one and the same as Antichrist, the Pope of Rome. Amen, amen. And you know what's interesting, um, Brother Rob, is that as you begin to mention this here, one thing that definitely comes to mind, and I know this is exactly what you're alluding to when you're speaking about this, and not so much alluding, but you're actually making it clear, and that is that when we see that the, the, word, the term Antichrist is not mentioned in the book of Revelation, it should be obvious to people that the false prophet would have to be the Antichrist because everyone knows. Now, we know we have an Antichrist spirit, as it's mentioned you know, when, when, when John brings that out, you know, that Antichrist is already, and we know that comes down through time. But clearly, with, with practically every prophecy teacher that is on the field today that knows the Antichrist is an end-time figure, then you would think then that the Antichrist would be in the book of Revelation, the most important end-time prophetic book on the scene. So you have to look for a different terminology. And, of course, this is when he, he moves from being Antichrist to false prophet. His ministry, in other words, is being elevated to, to, to its fullness at that particular point. And like you said before, you know, John is getting a clearer picture of who he is, and so now he's recognizing that he's not just an Antichrist, not just Antichristo, one that is like Christ, but he's also realizing that he's a very much a religious figure uh, in, in, the, in the respect of a false prophet. And something since we spoke last, uh, Brother Rob, that come to me recently that I really thought was profound, and, and you mentioned Walid Shabbat, um, it's odd. I was actually asked to be on a radio program with him a little while back, and I refused to go on the, the program. Uh, I, I did uh, say that, you know, if he would like to discuss the matter privately, I would discuss it with him, uh, which infuriated him when I refused to go on. And, uh, but the reason I refused to go on is because, in, in my opinion, uh, he is a Vatican puppet, and only uh, working for the Vatican because he really promotes the Vatican uh, and the agenda the Vatican has. Now, in light of that, um, and I'll just throw this at you here to see what your thoughts on this, Brother Rob, we know that one of the major false teachings that, it, that has swept a lot of uh, the churches today, especially the, the Catholic Church, who is the mother of this doctrine, and other churches have well have followed suits like the Lutherans and the Methodists, and that is the ideology of replacement theology. And as I was just sitting in the room the other day looking at the Word of God, I realized that the Muslim faith, which we know was founded by the Vatican, uh, according to um, um, the ex-Jesuit uh, that had came out, uh, um, oh gosh, his name slips his name slips my mind here for a second, but uh, but anyway, Alberto Rivera. There we go, Alberto Rivera. You know, he shared with us how that the Catholic Church created the Muslim religion to help to destroy the true Christian influence that was sweeping through by by the original Jewish believers, 
in the early early part of the birth of the Catholic Church, they wanted to stomp out those early uh, Christians. But in light of that, one of the key aspects I noticed in their belief is that even in the Quran, we see a replacement theology perpetrated in their scriptures and or in their book. I hate to call it scriptures, but in their, their particular book there. And when I say replacement theology, in the Quran it actually states they believe the whole Exodus story. They believe that the Jews were truly called the children of God. But when they write the account, they say that the children of Israel were so stiff-necked that when Moses goes up to the top of the mountain and God allows him to see the promised land, they write that there were two Muslims down, or two Arabs down there, and they call them by name. I forget the names that they're called by. And they said that these, these sons will believe you, and God at that point forsakes the Jews and turns to the Arab people, and Moses goes to them instead. And that is their version of replacement theology, which only proves that it's a Catholic doctrine such as the rosary. We see the Muslims, they do the rosary. In fact, my wife did a video the other day of a, of a Muslim man doing his own form of the rosary. They pray with beads and stuff, just like the Catholic Church. Their women dress like nuns. And, of course, Muhammad's wife, Kaji, she was a Roman Catholic. And this is what's so fascinating. So I just thought I'd throw that in there because I, I'd not thought about that before, that the Muslim people also have their own form of replacement theology. Well, that's, that's, that is interesting. And in terms of Walid Shabbat, uh, it, it is quite amazing to me, Steve, and I know you're the, in the same amazement when, for me to see people really buy into his presentation because he has the clear pattern. And anybody that listens to him, for example, on YouTube videos or on the TV, Christian airwaves, his clear pattern is that aside from his opening statement, his simple statement that I'm, on, I'm now going to talk on Bible prophecies, except for that statement, he immediately goes right out in the left field and comes nowhere close to teaching Bible prophecies. No, no, no closeness even remotely to teaching Bible prophecies. He, at best, what he does is, he, and this is his pattern, and it's a pattern of many uh, uh, TV orators and TV preachers, is Walid Shabbat will grab one Bible passage, like say 666, and he'll say, I am now going to speak on what that means. And then he goes right out in the left field, and he's completely in the spirit of confusion and deception and comes nowhere even remotely close to really teaching God's word on uh, the Bible prophecies. Not at all. It's amazing people would buy into that. Amen. That is so true, Brother Rob. You know, I know you not, actually... Not to, mention, you... not to mention, Steve, as you know, that Walid Shabbat's topics themselves are completely twisted away from the truths of God's word on Bible prophecies, whether it's the topic of Antichrist, who he thinks is a Muslim, the topic of 666, all the critical topics. Uh, he just decimates the, uh, the true meanings of these critical topics that God wants his people to know at this time. Amen. And, you know, Brother Rob, I, I got another question I'm going to ask you here in just a moment is going to be about the temple. And uh, before we get into that question there, something I'd just like to share with you, and, and, and you may already be aware of this, when we, when, we, when we go back and we look at Ezra, and, and this is more or less just to kind of set the stage for the question regarding uh, the third temple uh, that is to be built uh, from a prophetic standpoint, um, but when we go back and we look at the building of the second temple, when, when we read in the book of Ezra, and Ezra, as we know, is a scribe, but he comes down um, by the hand of God to actually to be a part in the construction of the second temple. Now, some people may not realize that Zechariah the prophet as well as Haggai were instrumental 
And I used to, I, I, for a long time, I didn't realize that before. And I, it wasn't the fact that I, I just forgot where I'd read that at. But as I was rereading that a little while back, I saw that they are the, two, they were the two prophets that were instrumental in the, in, 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 in the process of the third temple, which I thought was kind of ironic if you get into the, the subject of the two witnesses. But, uh, but not going into that particular area there. But what I found interesting is that when, when Ezra finds out, they're, he's really they're excited about the building of the second temple, and the word comes to Ezra that the leaders of Israel, and both political and in the uh, rabbinical side, actually have married into the daughters of Babylon. And Ezra, we know, rents his clothes, and, and, and weeps before the Lord in prayer until the evening, until the evening hour there, the evening sacrifice. Um, and I thought that was astonishing because to me, I'm watching, in reality, as I stand here in Jerusalem where I live at, uh, which I live part-time in Israel, part-time in the United States, but as I stand here right now, I have watched... Brother Rob, as well as, and, and you're well aware of the, 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 the current events in Israel, uh, as early as 1993 when Shimon Peres, the president of Israel today, he's now the president, uh, uh, that's the, the title they gave him, and, and he literally lives probably two, maybe three blocks away from me. In fact, I just passed his house a few minutes ago coming back home. And um, Shimon Peres sold out our nation to the Vatican in 1993, when everyone had their attention on Yasser Arafat in Washington, D.C. with the Oslo Accords, um, and, and all the while Israel is making a covenant with the Vatican. And, and even now, in, in recent times, with uh, and I love Benjamin Netanyahu with all my heart. I believe he is my brother, and I have a great deal of respect for him. But even some of our head rabbis, and this is about to repeat itself again, with the Pope of Rome coming here to Israel, uh, I think now it's actually the date was moved up to either May 24th or May 25th that he will be here and meeting with a couple of the head rabbis here. But every one are making the covenant with the Vatican, not knowing that they are repeating history that happened with Ezra. In other words, they're marrying in to the Babylonians. And, but I do believe... God is going to have mercy on them just as he did with Ezra because what did they do? Once they realized they had made the mistake because Ezra brings us out to them, you must divorce them. You must put them away. And the scripture really goes into this in, in the book of Ezra, what happens there. And, and, and they said we need a little time to be able to do this because some of them had children and everything else. But they, they did consent and they put them away. And I think that clearly speaks, Brother Rob, of the covenant that will be broken uh, in the midst of the week here. And just in light of some of these things, Brother Rob, and I know that you're teaching on the third temple, and is it important or is it bad, if you can elaborate on that. Because I, I am, uh, and I have to just say to, the, to the, those that are listening now, Brother Rob has got some very, very interesting insights on the third temple that I used to think that I, I felt like I was the only guy that ever knew these things. And, and my wife actually discovered his channel and, and we have listened many, many times and, and are just so blessed by what God has revealed to you about this. And your main question, Steve, is, is it dealing with the, the middle point where the sacrifices are stopped? We, we can, let's just go into each part of that. Maybe the first part, if we can, Brother Rob, if, if you will take scripturally, because I know even with some of my own listeners, uh, they're, not, they're, they're not crazy about the idea of the third temple. They think that, um, well, they look at the scripture where it says, God says, a body has thou made me, and the most high dwelleth not in temples made by hands, you know, but a body has he made me. And we know this. I believe that. I, I don't question that at all. But... I see a lot of times that people are, they, 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 they miss the fact that in order to fulfill prophecy, God is going to build the temple again, and yes, there will be temple sacrifices being offered. 
Uh, and whether or not, re regardless of what period that is, until he has opened up Israel's eyes to be able to recognize who the atonement is, it's still something that will take place. And, and, and that's something I'd like for you to elaborate on, is the, 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 the prophetic word of God, how it sets in place the building of the third temple. And then once we move from that, Brother uh, Rob, if we, then we can move into the well, it, I guess it goes together because the sacrifices being stopped shows right there that the Antichrist comes in and to exalt himself, to make himself look like he's someone great, which the world will end up believing in. Well, let me, let me first zero in on uh, several Bible verses that prove that the third temple must be built by the middle of the seven-year tribulation period. It must be built. And these are black and white scriptures to me. Always have been. One is Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, which most all of the Bible enthusiasts know, that Antichrist will make a firm covenant with the many, meaning the end-time Jews of Israel. And then in the middle of that week, or the middle of the seven-year period, is when Antichrist puts a stop to the sacrifices, meaning the animal sacrifices, at the middle of the seven-year period. So that's Daniel 9.27. Now, to me, it's always been very clear and very simple to see that Daniel 9.27 indicates that the coming third Jerusalem temple will have obviously been built by the middle point of the seven-year tribulation period, which, having it built by that point, enables the end-time Jews of Israel today to begin their Passover sacrifices by that mid-seven-year point because of the fact that their temple, the third temple, will have already been built and sitting there ready by the middle seven-year point, the temple is built and ready to have the end-time Jews begin their animal sacrifices again, which, like I said, in Daniel 9.27, Antichrist puts a stop to those animal sacrifices, which to me also is very easy and simple to extrapolate that those sacrifices that are being performed, according to Daniel 9.27, are Passover sacrifices. They'd have to be because the temple will have been built in order for Daniel 9.27's end-time Jews to begin their sacrifices. And as I say, and I am reiterating it, that they, they're, they're, they begin their sacrifices as a result of their third temple having just been built completely. So that's all Daniel 9.27. Another verse, which is really even more tangible, just black and white, undeniable, that the third temple must be built before that middle seven-year point, is Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. And those two verses say twice that the temple, the third temple, will have been built by the middle of the seven week. And it uses the term temple twice in Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. And Revelation chapter 11 itself, just the whole chapter 11, is clearly in the first three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation period. And then another quick point, based uh, or playing into Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, again, both of those two verses mention the word temple. But another key point is revelate, in terms of Revelation's chronology of the seven-year tribulation period, is Revelation chapter 13 itself, the whole chapter 13, is the mid point, the exact middle point, is shown in Revelation's chronology of the seven-year tribulation period. Chapter 13, the exact middle point in Revelation's chronology. So again, that reemphasizes that chapter 11 in verse 1 and 2 that mentions the temple having already been built 
is clearly built in the first three and a half years before the middle point of the seven-year tribulation period. And just real quickly, Steve, uh, for those that may not have their Bible open, I'll read quickly those two verses, verses 1 and 2, in Revelation chapter 11. And it says, There was given me a reed, this is the Apostle John speaking, There was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, and measure the altar, and measure them that worship in, in it. And then verse 2 says it again, But the court, which is without the temple, meaning the outer, third outer court of the already built temple, says to John, Leave out and measure it not, for it has been given unto the Gentiles and the holy city, they shall tread underfoot for 42 months. So, again, uh, Revelation 11 verse 2 reaffirms that not only is the temple built by the middle of the seven-year tribulation period, but it's even standing throughout the final 42 months of great tribulation. Very powerful verses. I could go on, I could name other verses, but uh, even Jesus' own words. Just match and confirm Ezekiel itself in Ezekiel's exclusive detailed account. Starting in chapter 40 of Ezekiel, his exclusive details of the, the construction and the beauty to the detail of this third coming temple are a perfect match to the temple going to be built third temple will be built by the middle of the seven-year tribulation period. Brother Rob, there's one thing, too, I'd like to just, and, and you may be aware of this, uh, I'm not sure, but geographically speaking, when you're reading in Revelation, and I, I, I remember back in, uh, I don't know if it's 2010 or 2011, when the Lord first revealed this to me. In fact, I got the Revelation in two different folds that, Revelation 11, um, I began to look at the Palestinian equation in this two-state solution. And then the Lord corrected me and made me uh, to realize that the Palestinians are only the tool in which the Vatican is using in order to gain the control or the fulfillment of these passages here in, verse, in Revelation 11. And specifically what I'm speaking about is where it says that leave out the outer court it will be given unto the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city. Now, that was what caught my attention, the holy city for 42 months, which, as we know, is three and a half years. And what's ironic, people may not be aware of this, but as the Pope of Rome is coming here at the end of May, he is already pushing. Now, I know this for a fact uh, from, from the news here in Israel that we get here in Israel, that he has actually contacted or excuse me, that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's office has contacted the chief rabbi of um, uh, King David's tomb. There's, you know, there's a rabbi over certain areas and certain artifacts in Israel. And so there is a synagogue right there at the same location. And this is the, the location of what is known as the, the, uh, the Last Supper or the Upper Room. Uh, sits right above uh, King David's tomb. And they have requested... That the, that the rabbi there hand over this property under the control of the Vatican. Now, it's also been mentioned here in the news that the Vatican is not just interested in King David's tomb, but all of Mount Zion. Now, Mount Zion is not the same as Mount Moriah, but it, but it, is, it is outside of what we call the, city, the old city, but what a lot of people are not aware of this is where the city of David, actually, the walls were encompassed these areas as well. So when the scripture says they will tread down this, the holy city 40 and two months, this is David's, the, the remnants of David's, which also, by the way, encompasses part of East Jerusalem, which is exactly what 
the Vatican is having the Palestinians negotiate for for their part of their state. And, and even so, Brother Rob, I would say this as well. I know some people, they keep looking to say, well, as soon as the Palestinians have a state, this is when we will know that, that, that the 70th week of Daniel's 70th week will begin, or the, as some people call it, the tribu- seven years of tribulation. But, and and I, I thought that at one time myself, but I also realize it's, that's not what the scripture actually says. It's talking about dividing the land, but even in this covenant here, if they allow the Vatican at the end of May to have Mount Zion, and according to the reports, the Vatican has stated they will allow Israel, and this is interesting, they're going to allow Israel to keep the Kotel, they're going to give the Temple Mount to the Palestinians, and they are going to get Mount Zion. If this takes place, they have in essence already divided the land. It doesn't take a Palestinian quote-unquote state, which by the way is already recognized by the United Nations as well as the Vatican and the rest of the world as being a state under occupation already. So in that regards, our land has already been divided. Well, you've covered a lot of ground in all of that, and I'd have to agree with everything you've said, Steve, and I also have emphasized a lot in my own live broadcasts over the last months and in videos that there's no Bible prophecy. I know you know this, Steve, because you're already talking about it, but most people are not aware, including Bible prophecy so-called experts are all hung up and totally focused on the uh, now suspended peace talks between Prime Minister Netanyahu and Mahmoud Abbas of the Palestinians. And most all people, world leaders, and Bible prophecy preachers, like I say, are trying to gauge the start of the seven-year tribulation period and the signing of a seven-year agreement trying to gauge that, that Bible prophecy of Daniel 9.27, as deriving from Netanyahu's and Mahmoud Abbas's peace talks, whether they succeed or whether they fail. And I started to say there's no Bible prophecy at all that makes any kind of, even remote uh, suggestion that the end-time Jews of Israel, Prime Minister Netanyahu, would have to shake hands with the Palestinians at all. That's not in the Bible. I know you know that, Steve, but most people don't, as you know, Steve. That's not in the Bible for the end-time Jews of Israel to shake hands in, in some kind of a friendship shake with the Palestinian Muslims of the world. That's not in there. That has nothing to do with it. And so uh, the seven-year agreement of Daniel 9.27 guarantees that that the two parties that are guaranteed, according to Daniel 9.27, to sign a seven-year agreement that allows Israel to build that third temple are the two parties of Antichrist, the Pope of Rome, and the end-time Jews of Israel. And as you know, Steve, and I know, and my Body of Christ audience and my networks know, that those two parties guaranteed to sign a seven-year agreement, Antichrist and the Jews of Israel, they're at the table. And they're getting ready to meet next month in June 2014, meet at the Vatican, when the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of Israel, Zev Elkin, will travel to the Vatican next month in June, attempting to sign some kind of an agreement, whether it's seven years or not. We'll all wait to see, but that really, to me, next month in June is the next bilateral plenary meeting between Israel's official and the Vatican's officials to try to sign that fundamental agreement, and that was created. It's a contract. It's called the Fundamental Agreement, and that was created in 1993 by John Paul II, And the bottom line of where I'm leading with all of this plays back into what you were saying, Steve, is that that fundamental agreement, which is a contract, that's the name of it, created and authored 
1993 by John Paul II is the fundamental agreement contract that the Vatican and Israel are meeting next month in June to try to finalize. And again, whether it's seven years or not, we'll have to wait and see. But uh, that is the next very tangible potential possibility for a seven-year agreement of Daniel 9.27 to be signed by the two parties Daniel 9.27 designates, Antichrist, the Pope, and the Jews of Israel. But I agree with you wholeheartedly, Steve, is I personally, I'm open. I'm open to the seven-year agreement between the Vatican and Israel based in Daniel 9.27. I'm open to the possibility of other world leaders signing on to it. Maybe even Mahmoud Abbas himself will sign on to it with a happy face as he signs it. And maybe the United Nations will sign on to the coming seven-year agreement between the Pope and Israel. And maybe the United States leaders like President Obama or John Kerry or Angela Merkel of Germany or Tony Blair, all sorts of people, world leaders, could sign on to the seven-year agreement, including a boss. But it's absolutely not required at all for anybody to sign on to it. And more, more pointedly, just to restate, because this is key, is that Daniel 9.27 pinpoints the only two parties that are guaranteed to sign a seven-year agreement. And that's Antichrist, the Pope of Rome, signing a seven-year agreement with the end-time Jews of Israel. I think, Steve, one quick point is that, like you were talking about, that all this talk about a divided Jerusalem and a two-state solution, which everybody in the world wants, everybody, except the born-again body of Christ, the born-again body of Christ is the only people that I see that, uh, I'm not in favor of dividing Jerusalem at all. But I was going to say, Steve, that whether they have the term two-state solution built into a seven-year agreement that's coming, I'm open to that possibility. But the ultimate seven-year agreement will be uh, the Vatican, the Pope of Rome, shaking hands with the end-time Jews of Israel, regardless of who else does or does not sign on to it. And that's really the main focus that I'm watching these days. Daniel 9.27. Amen. You know, Brother Rob, one thing I'll Let's say... Steve, real I, quick, I, I, though, before we go on, I've mentioned up front okay. that there's 45 minutes in the interview. I, we've got a solid hour and uh, another, just over an hour to talk. So take your time. I, I do want you to have full okay. control of the direction of the interview. So take your time. Okay, brother. Here's what something I think, brother Robin. I don't know if you if you if, if you if I've ever mentioned this to you before or not, but a, a passage I'd like to just read real quick from Ezekiel, and I think that really God really made it clear in Ezekiel the the events that would transpire. I know that, um, and before I mention this one here. Uh, there was back when the, the covenant was first announced, when John Kerry they, they first announced that they were going to do a nine month negotiation. There was a little sister that wrote me a letter, and she said, "You know, Brother Steve, when I heard about uh, you talking about, because I, I did a video saying that they're they're doing a nine month negotiation," and she said, "I couldn't help but think of Micah four, and of course in Micah chapter four, where it speaks about O daughter of Zion." Uh, who's who's in travail to bring forth her children, and uh, and Micah four, and I'll just quickly kind of go through these here that I've always found was fascinating. When when she sent that to me, the Lord just really began to deal with me, and the first one He dealt with me on, and, and maybe other people as well. I know other people talked about it later, but you know I have no idea how God deals with people, but. Immediately, the Lord put in my heart, this negotiations will be a fulfillment of, uh, of, of the story where uh, uh, Rebecca, when she has Esau and Jacob in her womb, and she goes before the Lord, and she says, because the children were wrestling in the womb, and she says, why, is, why am I thus? And 
the Lord tells her, he says, because it's two nations in your womb. And when they come forth from the womb, they will be separated. And the Lord seemed to lay it in my heart that this is what this whole negotiation was about. It was the birthing of the two nations. Now, I say that not technically meaning that the Palestinians are that nation, but watch what unfolds in all of this, though. Several things happen. When we think about, and I want to come back to Micah 4 in just a second, but let me just share with you something he showed me in Ezekiel 35. And I believe Brother Rob this clearly is speaking about this very event. And it, it starts, well, it goes further, but I'm just going to read a short part of this. He's talking about Mount Seir and Edom, which uh, and whether, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, Brother Rob, but, but many of the Orthodox Jewish people here, we have always known that Rome is Edom because Esau later, when he married amongst the, 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 the Arab women, and he migrated, his descendants eventually, according to the teachings in the Orthodox uh, tradition, we believe that they ended up going to Rome. And that's where his descendants went, what we call uh, the modern-day Babylon. So Jews are very much aware that Adam, scripturally, represents the Catholic Church. Um, Now, in light of that, when you read here in the 35th chapter, and I'll just start with verse 9 here. It says, I will make thee a perpetual desolation, and he's talking about Adam, and thy city shall not return, and you shall know that I am the Lord, because thou hast said these two nations and these two countries shall be mine, and we will possess it, whereas the Lord was there. Now, the only place we know that the Lord has ever been was here in Israel. It says, therefore... As I live, saith the Lord God, I will even do according to thine anger and according to thine envy, which thou hast used out of thy hatred against them, and when I make myself known among them. Now that's at, the very, that's at this hour, Brother Rob. That's the hour he's going to make himself known among them, speaking of Israel, is the day we're living in now. He says, so when I make myself known among them, when I have judged thee, So God is going to reveal himself to the Jews, who he really is, who Mashiach is, when he brings judgment upon Rome. Now, it goes on to say, And thou shalt know that I am the Lord, and that I have heard all thy blasphemies which thou hast spoken against the mountains of Israel, saying, They are laid desolate, they are given us to consume. Thus with your mouth you have boasted against me and have multiplied your words against me. I have heard them. Thus saith the Lord God, when, when the whole earth rejoiceth, I will make thee desolate. And Brother Rob, I was just blown away when I read these passages here because it clearly shows us that the negotiations between the Palestinians and Israel, that part of the quote-unquote two-state solution, is not where the real negotiation is. It clearly identifies that Adam, or the descendants of Esau, so to speak, uh, what we would call the Vatican, that their intention is to take both nations. And we know that according to Shimon Peres, and this, I believe Barry Chamish was the first uh, reporter that, re- that wrote about this or brought it to light, that when Shimon Perez made the agreement to the Vatican in 1993, that in his statement that what they would do with Jerusalem is they would bring a United Nations force into Jerusalem and they would make it a city for all nations to come to worship. Basically, trying to bring the millennium without Christ, or in this case, with their Antichrist. They believe that the Pope of Rome is fulfilling the coming of Mashiach. And you said, Brother Rob, yourself, which just astonished me, and I don't know if you mentioned it tonight since we've been talking, but your statement to me the other day just blew me away. I never thought about it like this. But you said that when the Pope of Rome comes and puts an end to the sacrifices that are being offered in the temple in the middle of the 70th week, he will look like the greatest man to the world, and the reason being is because most Christians believe that to offer another sacrifice would be blasphemous because Yahshua, being 
or Jesus being the ultimate sacrifice. So in this regard, though we know the scripture clearly says, according to Daniel, that he's to bring and stop the sacrifice and oblation, the, the, the world's not going to look at this as being the Antichrist at this point here. They're going to get it all confused. They're going to think this is the greatest guy. You know, he look at him. He's got the boldness to come and put an end to what should not be going on. And that, Brother Rob, that, that so blessed me when you shared that with me the other day. Well, yeah. And, um, well, I learned, uh, learned a lot by listening. I was following along with you, Steve, in Chapter 35 of Ezekiel, following every verse and uh, learned from that. I had not been aware of that, that, um, that the Israel people there um, interpret Edom as um, Rome. And uh, very interesting. It sure that's, lines that's up. Some... As I was reading along, it, it... Go, go right ahead, Steve. I'm sorry, Brother Rob. Let me just throw this there? one thought in there. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear yep, me, Brother Rob? You. Okay. Here, yep, here's one you. thought right ahead, to that. Okay, here's what I was going to say before, because uh, I want you to really, uh, to, 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 I love to hear your responses on these things, Brother Rob. One of the things in, in light of that, too, uh, that goes with it is when, and, and this was something that when the sister had contacted me and mentioned to me that about Micah 4, uh, in, in chapter 4 of, of Micah, and I'm just quickly trying to run over to that. Here we go. Um, this really caught my attention because God says here in verse 9, now why dost thou cry out aloud, is there no king in thee? Is thy counselor perished, for, is, uh, for pains have taken thee as a woman in travail? Now, it's interesting that Micah states this because God is actually, before he's going to deliver Israel, because we know Micah 4, this is when God is going to deliver Israel from her enemies. But he asked her two questions that should make us as Jews think. He asked, the first question is, is there no king in thee? I get a little excited on this one, Brother Rob. So he said, is there no king in thee? What is he talking about when he asked that question? Where was our sin? Where did Israel, where did we sin originally? We sinned. Samuel the prophet was God's provided way, was God using a prayer. He used Moses. Now, God wanted to deal with Israel one-on-one, -on -one, like we see amongst the, the Christian believers. God deals with them one-on-one. -on -one. The Holy Spirit has come in there. God's restoration of the life that comes into the Christian believer that believes, or even a Jewish believer that wants to believe. But here's the thing, though. When God came down on Mount Sinai, he was showing, he was foreshadowing that when Mashiach would come, he would pour out his spirit. So when he come down before all the people, he was showing them that he wanted to be with them. He wanted to be in their hearts. But Israel got afraid, and they said, let not God speak, but only Moses. So then God had to use the secondary means, which was through a prophet, and that worked for so long until Samuel came along. And when Samuel the prophet came along, finally Israel, they kept looking at the way the world was going and how the Gentiles were doing everything. And so they said, we want a king to lead us into battle. That's the key part right there, to lead us into battle. And Samuel went before the Lord because it broke his heart. And God said, they've not rejected you, Samuel. They rejected me from ruling over them. Tell them what will happen, but give them their king. Now, we did get a couple of good kings. We got David. We got Solomon, David being the greatest of the kings. So what happens is we are on our road back home again. We're, in other words, the way we left God is the way we have to come back to God. And our first mistake was asking for a king. And then eventually we got an Ahab, which... We know what Ahab did. You know, him and Jezebel, they threw the whole country into idolatry. And finally, Mashiach comes to try to get this problem straightened out, which we knew that he did get it straightened out by giving his life, no doubt about it. But the thing is, then the temple was destroyed. Now Israel was scattered. We're back home again, Brother Rob. And we're in our homeland. Now they say the desert will blossom like a rose. This is only artificial. 
even though Israel is just blooming like crazy, but we put it out by putting little water hoses. The other day when I was praying for rain in Israel because I'm, I was discouraged to see that our land is so dry, and then God sends 47 centimeters, about three and a half inches of rain here the very next day. And I told my wife, I said, this is what God is going to do in the near future. I said, it'll no longer be a barren land. But what is it about that king? When, the, when they say in there, when God asks them, where is your king? Why? Because the nations are gathering against us. And Benjamin Netanyahu, he was anointed of God to be the king of Israel. And, when, and, and I don't know what uh, Michael, uh, I can't think of Mike's last name, Mike Evans. I don't know his beliefs or his theology or nothing like that. But I do believe that when he laid hands on him, not knowing who he was, and prayed for him and prophesied that he would be prime minister of Israel, not once but twice, I do believe that that was of God. But what God is asking Israel through the prophet Micah is, where is your king? In other words, as good as he is and as hard as he's trying to, to lead Israel into battle, so to speak, it's not working. Why? Because God is wanting us to turn our attention to the Messiah. And so then he asks the second question, which is so critical. He says, has your counselor perished? He's not talking about the king. He's talking about Yeshua. He is the counselor, prince of peace. And it's all prophetic. And so he's trying to get our attention to show us our mistakes. And then he allows all the travail to come upon us, like these negotiations. Next, it will be the armies trying to come at us. But then he says, should I stop the, basically, should I stop the pains? No. This is where I'm going to deliver you. Brother Rob, go ahead, brother. I, I love you so much, brother Rob. You've been an inspiration for my heart. Well, thank you, Steve. And I have to add, uh, because I'm, you've covered a lot of ground there. It's all just rich, what you've described. And is uh, it all points to the, I know you know this, Steve, but it, a lot of uh, believers in the body of Christ uh, sometimes have the l legitimate question is what's the purpose or even the need to build the third temple? And they really don't know why that's needed. And ultimately, God's word, as you and I know, Steve, says that that third temple, even Ezekiel's description starting in chapter 40 of Ezekiel, and Revelation chapter 11, verse 1 and 2, that say it will be built by the middle of the seven-year tribulation period, the reason it will be built uh, in addition to the main reason of God's word says it will be built, but the reason it will be built is so it will be ready and existing for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And that's exciting. And Amen. all the things you're describing in detail, Steve, obviously are just rich and play right into all of that. Go right ahead, my brother. No, brother Rob, you... you that that is what's so needful is what you're talking about right now it's there there is such a void brother brother rob and people understanding the the need for the third temple that it is prophetic and mainly from from what it looks like to me brother rob and and and, and this is so important that that, that you elaborate on this uh, as well is that when we look at the the coming of the third temple People, I guess what it is, the, the one thing that the, that the Christian community is not aware of is that in the beginning, as God is dealing with Israel in her homeland once again, it, we have to, God is basically, is, like I said before, he's doing this in a reverse order. So the temple must be back in place. And... And basically, everything has to be reset up the way it was 2,000 years ago. And this is something, Brother Rob, that I mentioned a little while back when the Lord dealt with me on that, that God is literally resetting up 
everything as it was 2,000 years ago. Rome has to be in control here. Israel has to be under the oppression of Rome because when Yeshua come the first time, they were under the oppression of Rome then, and they wanted to be delivered of the Romans. In fact, this is what they thought Mashiach was coming to do. And, and why, couldn't understand them when he, when he died, why didn't he deliver them from Rome? Well, then, of course, the believers, they see that he resurrected, and, and they begin to understand better what this was all about. He was fulfilling scripture to reach out, and to, to, as Abraham, he, God prophesied to Abraham, he would be a father of many nations, not just Israel. And so, therefore, the scripture had to be fulfilled. But in, in light of this, you know, so many people are looking at the third temple as being, okay, the Antichrist is going to build it, and, and, and it's going to be for him, and, and everything about it is going to be evil. But nowhere do we see in prophecy, Brother Rob, that I can find to where the third temple is evil. In fact, God himself, and, and, and Brother Rob, correct me, I'm not sure on this one here, but it looks like to me that the, that the temple that is described by Ezekiel is, is actually the third temple, and will be used during the millennium. And he himself says to the prophet Ezekiel, he gives him the very order of how the sacrifices are to be reinstituted. And it seems to be because when the temple is first built, and like you've, I've heard you say before, whether or not that's for two weeks, three weeks, or whatever the time, time is, we don't know. But the thing is, is it's got to be back in place again because when, he, when the temple is first built, God still hasn't revealed himself to the Jews yet. And I think that's where it lays at, Brother Rob. Well, I agree again, Steve, with everything you've said, right to the detail. Uh, the third temple is a very exciting, wonderful blessing of God that has to be in place, not only for the return of the Messiah, so he can reign um, in the newly built temple for a thousand year reign of Christ, Jesus, uh, as you say, the, the blessings are, uh, all of the blessings, including the animal sacrifices you've talked about, that's scriptural. Most, most body of Christ believers really have not become aware, they haven't studied the fact that the Old Testament Bible prophecies, like Ezekiel, for example, Ezekiel, as you know, Steve, details the reinstitution of animal sacrifices at the building of the third temple all the way through the thousand-year reign of Christ will there be animal sacrifices. That's exciting. That's Bible prophecies. I know you know it, Steve. But people need to open up the book of Ezekiel and uh, uh, even towards the last chapters, uh, 48 of Ezekiel, Ezekiel is very specific on and detailed about the reinstitution of animal sacrifices, which aren't really a perfect match to the Mosaic requirements for the 1,000-year reign of Christ, but still, it's definitely a re-establishing of animal sacrifices through the 1,000-year reign and done in the temple, the newly built third temple, and if... Uh, my own listeners are listening and don't understand why, then in a simple word, uh, the reason animal sacrifices will be reinstituted, besides the fact that God says that it will be reinstituted, is as a reminder, and this is what Steve was just talking about, is the animal sacrifices throughout the thousand-year reign as Jesus is reigning on earth, those animal sacrifices are reinstituted as a reminder to all of the people during that thousand-year millennial period of the cross of Christ, the blood shed by the Messiah Jesus on the cross, the, the temple itself, the animal sacrifices are all a reminder of what happened at the cross and reminds everybody during those 1,000 years of the uh, essential need for us to embrace Jesus who is on earth with us at that point, and that we need to still remember what Jesus did at that cross 2,000 years ago. And like I said, 
the reinstitution of animal sacrifices throughout the entire 1,000-year reign, the millennial 1,000-year period, is a reminder of the blood that Jesus himself poured out once and for all. And it's a very exciting scenario, of the, starting with the building of the third temple. And one of the quick points, though, Steve, was uh, I was thoughtful of this when you were speaking, is in terms of the blessings and excitement of the third temple being built, for Jesus, that's why it's being built, it's all about Jesus, is that the, the, the real prime evil thing that happens, which really isn't, it isn't an evil thing about the temple at all. And the evil thing, as you know, Steve, is the Antichrist himself. That's what's evil. And so the fact that you have a Gentile Antichrist, the Pope, you have a Gentile at the middle of the seven-year period. This is what's evil. This is what starts the abomination of desolation itself. If you have a Gentile Antichrist, the Pope of Rome, entering into the Holy of Holies, which the Old Testament law says that nobody except the Jewish high priest is to enter into that inner sanctuary with God, only the designated Jewish high priest. Well, that's partly what's abominable, because you don't have a Jewish high priest. You have a Gentile Antichrist the Pope of Rome, and the fact that you've got a Gentile entering into the temple at all is quite abominable. And not to mention the greatest abomination of that Gentile Antichrist taking his seat inside the inner sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, of the newly built Third Temple, and sitting down declaring himself as God and the high priest on earth, a Gentile doing it. And that's abominable right there. Not to mention, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, tells us that he not only takes his seat as the high priest, which is an abomination in itself, but declares himself as being God. And that's shown in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. And so, uh, that's... Uh, and one other quick point comes to mind is and we've talked about this somewhat in this discussion today, is the fact in the middle of the seven weeks when Antichrist puts a stop to the animal sacrifices that have, will have started up briefly towards the middle of the seven-year period, once that temple is built, the third temple, by the middle of the seven-year period. And once it's built, then the Jews will begin sacrificing Animal sacrifices, lambs, Passover lambs, and that will go on for a matter of days. It could be a couple, three days. It looks like it very well could be conceivably a 6, 10, 14 days maybe. Uh, I look at it more as, as just maybe a day or two max because of what Daniel talked about, that from that the time that the sacrifices stopped and the abomination is, of desolation is set up, there'll be 1,290 days. So Daniel places the stopping of the sacrifices in the middle of the seven years, and the abomination of desolation places those two events together in the exact middle point of the seven-year period. And then from that middle point, when the sacrifices are stopped and Antichrist sits inside of the temple in the middle of the seven years, Daniel, in the same verse, says there'll be 1,290 days later, meaning the return of Christ. But my point, though, Steve, on this uh, presentation here that I'm talking about is that when Antichrist stops the animal sacrifices, then obviously uh, the animal sacrifices in themselves, believers should recognize this, and they need to learn about this. Once the third temple is built by the middle point of the seven years and the Jews of Israel today begin sacrificing animals, that's not an evil thing either. That's a wonderful thing. And we should look at that as that's Bible prophecy. But where the evil starts is when Antichrist stops 
those sacrifices. And then it just gets more evil and more evil as it goes. He takes his seat in the temple, declaring himself as the high priest, even though he's a Gentile, and declares himself as being God. That's what Second Thessalonians 2.4 states. And it just goes on and gets worse. But by the time Jesus comes back, on the final day of the seven-year tribulation period, and that newly built third temple is still sitting there, basically untouched. It may have been desecrated and trampled on for 42 months, but it's still a glowing, glorious third temple. And when Jesus comes back, he'll enter through the east gate. And uh, so it's a very exciting thing. And then, of course, um, starting into the thousand-year reign is when those animal sacrifices will kick back up and be a tremendous reminder for a thousand years of what was accomplished at the cross in the true Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, with glory to God. And I praise his magnificent name for it. Amen. This is a deep discussion, Stephen. I'm I'm very, very thankful we're having it. It's just very rich. Amen. 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 Praise God. Brother Rob, it is such a blessing such a blessing and I've learned so much in this time that we've spent together and, I, and I'm hoping we get to do this again very soon um, and you know brother Rob I just one thing I'd like to just mention though when we're talking about it because one thing I, I hope that people really understand that when when Jesus was here on this earth Inside of him was the tree of life. It was God's own life in him. Just like when he told Moses to smite the rock, take the elders of Israel out there with you. And not the one where he said, speak to the rock, which was 38 years later in the journey. But at the very beginning, when they first come out of the, across the Red Sea, probably within, a, within the first 30 days, he tells uh, they were thirsting, they were complaining about not having water, and God said, take the elders with you and go down and smite the rock that it bring forth its waters. And he named the place according to the argument, and the argument was, is God among us or not? And what's so beautiful about that, when Jesus came, when Yeshua himself came on this earth, he was that rock. As Paul clearly states to us, he was that rock. Even the Jews, we know that the, the rock that was smitten twice, two different times, according to the biblical accounts, two different locations. But in Hebrew, it clearly calls it the rock, as you'd say in English, Hatsua. Hatsua is how we say that. And so the rabbis know that it had to have been the same rock, even though it's different locations, because of the way God identifies it, which clearly shows that it is... Christ, it is Jesus himself that was smitten. But that rock, when he smote that rock, brother Rob, it was showing that the waters of life, as, as it's written in, in, in the Jewish Bible, it's called the waters of life. When he smote the rock, that water poured out. And even Jesus gave the Samaritan woman a sign to look for when he spoke to her at the well and he said, if you knew it was it was talking to, talking to you, you would ask me for a drink of water. He was giving her a sign to watch for. Now, he, we know that it speaks to the Holy Spirit, but when he was on the cross and he had died, and the Roman soldier took and pierced his side with that sword, and the Bible says water and blood came separated from his side, God was giving Israel a sign to see if they would only open their eyes that he indeed was the rock and that the water was flowing from the rock after it had been judged by the elders of Israel and smitten by the high priest, so to speak. In other words, of course, we know Rome is the one that actually pierced his side. But what did it show? Him as a sacrifice, Yeshua as a sacrifice, did what no other animal sacrifice could do. The animal sacrifice, when his life died, his life could not come back upon you. It could not come within your heart. And Yeshua, he came as one of the sacrifices so that the life of God could once again be released 
and it could come out and it could come back upon us so that we would have eternal life. That's why Jesus said, a man, if he were to believe on me, he shall never die. He shall never taste death. And, and I just think, Brother Rob, that this is the one part, if people understand nothing else about why sacrifices are done to the millennium, and I think you made it so beautiful, it is a reminder to us, not to mention the house of Israel has been resurrected that never got to see Jesus. They never knew nothing about him. And now they have been resurrected, and they're learning about him, and they're finding out who he was. So it's all the puzzle begins to come together in our appreciation for what he did. We see, especially even for the Gentiles that never knew nothing about sacrifices, to lay their hand on an innocent animal that's taken the place taking your place, which I don't know if the Gentiles would be doing that part, because we clearly see that even when the teaching was done by, by Paul, when they came together, they said, do not put these burdens on the Gentiles. But yet Paul in Matthew, or Acts 21, we see that he consented to a sacrifice to be offered for him for the purification process, according to Numbers chapter 6. You know, but anyway, Brother Rob, I love you so much, and, and, and and however you would like to, to conclude this, I would like to say to our own listeners, as we, once we get this all uploaded ourselves, which will probably be tomorrow before we get everything fully done, because I want to add some, some uh, footage of Israel as we're speaking in the background as we speak about these things. But I would just like to tell the people, Brother Rob, is, his website is heisnear.com. Um, his teachings are marvelous. They're, they're, they're to the point. Brother Rob is just a, 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 a really anointed uh, minister and teacher, and I know Brother Rob also has, has written books as well, and I, I can't encourage you enough uh, to, to check out his website, which you can get that information there, and to, and to, to get more, more understanding. I, I, you know, God does it that way. He just takes different people with different gifts and, and is able to, to build and work with the body of Christ. And I love you, Brother Rob, and we thank you so much for this opportunity and that you would be willing to come with us and as well sharing with your, with your own listeners uh, the, the interview we've done together. I think it's just a blessing all the way around. Well, it sure is, Steve. And when we get off the line here, within a couple, three minutes, I will send this link to you as you requested up front. And... What I really feel strongly prompted to, uh, to say, Steve, in concluding all of this wonderful, wonderful discussion about God's Word and the end-time third temple that's coming and the end-time nation of Israel is, and this is strong in me, is Ezekiel chapter 38, particularly starting in verse 18, but particularly verse 23, because those verses go together. And Ezekiel 38, verse 18, God is speaking, and he's talking about the one-day war of Ezekiel 38 and 39, which is shaping up quickly to occur. And without going into the teaching on all of that, of course, is the timing of when Ezekiel 38, 39, one-day war occurs on the mountains of Israel, it will occur a matter of months into the seven-year tribulation period, where in one day, Israel will blow away, basically, blow away Russia, all of Israel's Muslim military enemies, Iran, uh, Libya, Ethiopia, etc., Beth Togomar, which is Turkey, and on that one day, miraculous victory of Israel, basically blowing them all away, Russia and all of the Muslim military enemies, on the mountains of Israel, as Israel defends itself with the miraculous divine victory by God, then just five or six or maybe ten months or so into the seven-year tribulation period, when that one-day war and one-day victory occurs for Israel, then God says in Ezekiel 38, starting in verse 18, particularly verse 23, 
that on that day I shall magnify myself, I shall sanctify myself, and I shall make myself known in the sight of many nations, and they will know that I am the Lord God. And that's powerful. And God will use his divine power and protection upon Israel during that one-day war that this world will see on TV news. And through that one-day miraculous victory that anybody will be able to recognize God's divine hand on Israel in that one-day victory will have the most tangible outpouring of God's Spirit where he himself says he will make himself known among many nations by the powerful, miraculous victory of tiny little Israel. And then my last point, Steve, is once that one-day victory takes place and Israel will have very much wiped out her military Muslim enemies. They're gone militarily. They're out of the way. Then Israel just those six or maybe ten months into the seven-year period after that one day of victory will have a clear pathway, Israel, unhindered by any other militaries, for her to quickly build her third temple in the remaining two years or so, maybe two and a half years left, before that middle point of the seven-year tribulation period. And... I know I've said a lot there, and it's a whole different tangent, but I'm very strongly impressed to say all that, Steve, and really to reiterate my main and last point is Ezekiel 38, verse 23, and that is a very exciting, sovereign move of God that's coming on that one day of Israel's miraculous victory on her own mountains. And God says, I will sanctify myself, magnify myself and make myself known among many nations and they shall know that I am the Lord God and that's what's coming and it's going to be the most sovereign outpouring of God's spirit that's coming that much of the body of Christ scratches their head about tries to conjure up when the next outpouring will be and where it will start. and It's all found in Ezekiel 38, verse 23. And Israel, and the miraculous victory of Israel on her own mountains is how God will bring forth the, his own sovereign outpouring of his spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, Steve, uh, you've Amen. got the last word, my brother. Take your time and... Uh, I feel God's presence so strongly in this discussion today, Steve. It's, and it's just increased to the point where I'm personally sitting under a saturation anointing right now. We're talking of the deep Amen. things of God's heart when we're talking about Israel. And we're talking about God's heart when we talk about end-time Jews of Israel and the third temple being built for the Messiah to return. Very exciting discussion. Steve and I... I just thank you so much, brother, for for calling in from Israel, taking your time, and and also the rich wisdom and knowledge you've provided here from God's Word on just these very important topics. I just thank you so much, Steve. Brother Rob, I feel the same. I so much do, and and it's you know it's, it's so beautiful that you said that you felt led to to speak about this last part like you did because in my own heart I was actually wanting to go into this but I knew that the time we were we'd been pretty lengthy and I thought well in my heart I thought well God next time I'll get with brother Rob and and ask him to kind of lay out that time frame and how the events take place and you went and laid right out what was on my heart and that is how the war comes, how the temple is built right there after that. And, uh, and sadly enough, though, we see that before the war even happens, the covenant between the Vatican and Israel is going to have to be signed. That will give the Vatican the right 
to try to come, well, not just try, but will be successful in stopping the sacrifices. And I have wondered, and one thing I just, I've got to ask you now, Brother Rob, this question here, and that is, I have looked at the scripture, and I have wondered about this here, and I'm not really sure on this, so I wanted to get your take on this, this last closing statement, and if you would close with this, and that is, when we see that the, the, the Antichrist comes in and puts a stop to, to the sacrifices, now we also realize that we're uh, at the time frame that the two witnesses, from what I can see, will be on the scene at the beginning. I think that's right. They'll be on the scene at the beginning of this particular time, unless for some reason they come in in the last half, but it looked like they come in at the first half. Uh, but one thing that I do know that's pretty obvious is once they're killed, we know that the Bible clearly says that the world will rejoice at their death because of all the trouble they bring by the plagues and things that, that they're able to bring out in their ministry. Now, and we also see clearly, and I actually read, I think I read it tonight when we were reading some of these passages here, is that God talks about that he will, that he will magnify himself against them, speaking of Rome, when all the nations rejoice, which to me clearly shows he brings the judgment on the Vatican at the, at the time, right after the time when they're rejoicing over the death of the two witnesses. So my question is, Brother Rob, seeing you've already laid out the time frame for the Gog and Magog War, the victory, the building of the temple being right there in the first half, we know that the Antichrist desecrates it. How does this play in? with God destroying the Vatican and the two witnesses, do you see it that they come at the beginning or do they come in the second half? Well, the two, the two witnesses definitely come in the second half. Definitely. Without question, that's found in Revelation chapter 11, verse 3, right after the first two verses that talk about the temple being already built. And then Revelation chapter 11, verse 3 says, and I'm reading it, I will empower my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days dressed in sackcloth. Revelation 11, verse 3. So that's just one verse of several, but that's the main verse that specifically frame those two witnesses as prophesying for the final 1260 days and the final three and a half years of great tribulation. Yes, absolutely. And um, let's see, what was, you, what was the other point you, you were inquiring about, Steve? About Rome? Well, in, in, that, in that case there, Brother Rob, it would actually even answer the question for me because I never could quite figure out myself, was it the beginning or the, or the, or the mid part where they come in at? Uh, but if, it's the, if, if we see that they're coming in on the last uh, three and a half years of the seven-year uh, covenant there, then it would answer the question as to God saying when he destroys, uh, basically I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing the words by saying the Vatican or Rome, uh, because we know that he destroys that when all the world rejoices, and they only rejoice at the death of the two witnesses there. And so that would, of course, would be at the very end, that would be that final judgment as uh, even as the scripture says, the whole world mourns and weeps over as they see her burning from afar uh, because she had made the world rich by her delicacies. Okay, I, I, that's, I'm right with you again now. Well, that, that would talk about uh, Revelation chapter 18. Actually starting, this is a quick 30-second quick, um, teaching, but it's just right to the point, and, and people need to recognize that it is rather simple the way I lay it out, but in Revelation chapter 17, verse 18, in terms of Rome, Revelation 17, verse 18 states specifically, and I'm reading it, the woman whom you saw, that's the great harlot, the woman whom you saw is, and I've got that word circled in my Bible, Revelation chapter 17, verse 18, the woman whom you saw is, the great city. That's Rome. And then the next same verse says, which reigns over the kings of the earth. That's Rome. Revelation 17, 18. So that tells us specifically 
that the woman whom you saw, that's the great harlot herself, is the great city Rome. It's not part of it. It's not like Rome. It is Rome. It's the one and the same. The great harlot is Rome. And then in terms Amen. of Rome falling, Steve, you mentioned that. You go to the next chapter, 18 of Revelation, and just uh, just to zero in on the one verse, because there's several verses that lead into it. In fact, you talked about it. Uh, Revelation 18.5. You just mentioned her sins have piled up as high as heaven. This is the great harlot, Rome. Revelation 18, verse 5. Her sins have piled up as high as heaven. And it goes on. And then in terms of Rome's fall, in Revelation chapter 18, verse 8, it says, for this reason, meaning... In fact, the prior verse 7 says she glorified herself. That's Rome. She lived sensuously. That's Rome. That's all verse 7. Then verse 8 of Revelation 18 says, For this reason, in one day, her plagues will come. Pestilence and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire. For the Lord God who judges her is strong. That's Revelation 18, verse 8. So, yes, and that's in the final three and a half years, Revelation chapter 18. So, yes, her, her uh, Rome's burning, literally, burned up in one hour. And, of course, uh, the Antichrist, uh, he'll be over sitting in Israel at that point anyway. So, he will, he'll be untouched, but from a distance of Antichrist being in Israel the last final three and a half years, then Antichrist, the Pope, will sure see from a distance that Rome is burned down in one hour. But those two witnesses, Steve, as I said, uh, Revelation 11, verse 3, says, I will empower my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days, the final three and a half years, and they'll be preaching the gospel of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, and many people will be saved, including many, many Jews of Israel accepting their Messiah. Very, very exciting times coming. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Brother Rob, for having me. And we and, and, and likewise, we thank God that you were, were willing to come and be a part with us. I know this will air on both our channels there and will be a blessing, uh, no doubt a blessing for people. And, uh, and I just thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart that we got together and that, that God made this possible. Well, thank you, Steve. Wonderful, wonderful conversation and wonderful Bible passages and, and all glorifying the Lord. And just thank you so much, Steve, for your time, your input, and your your very rich wisdom, as I said. It's just very, very awesome. And hope you all have a, just a wonderful day, your, yourself and your wife in the Holy Land. And God protect you and protect all of your loved ones, Steve, and just uh, uh, be well and safe. And uh, I'll look forward to chatting with you again at another time, Steve. It's been tremendous. Thank you, brother. God bless you, and, and God bless those listening. Good night. God bless you, Steve, and have a wonderful day in the Holy Land, Steve. Thank you again, Steve. Thank you, brother. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.